Transportation of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure and the Subcommittee on Transportation and Maritime Security on the Committee of Homeland Security will come to order. We're in order. Uh, I unanimously, I, I ask unanimous consent that the chairman uh, be authorized to declare a recess at any time during the, today's joint hearing. That objection, show that order. I ask unanimous consent that the members not on the subcommittee but on either committee's full committee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's joint hearing and ask questions without objection. Show that order. As a reminder to members, uh, wish to insert a document into the record, please also email it to documents, ti at mailhouse.gov. I now recognize myself for the purpose of uh, opening statement for five minutes. Before we begin, I want to mention recent tragedy in the port of uh, Baltimore. First and foremost, our thoughts are with the victims and their families. We greatly appreciate the work of the Coast Guard and other first responders in their <clears throat> heroic and other first res uh, in heroic efforts in response to the, this tragedy. As the work gets underway to reopen the channel and rebuild the bridge, carry out an investigation, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee will closely monitor developments and work with the families and stakeholders impacted. Turning to agenda at hand, uh, we meet today at Port, Port Miami to examine port safety and security and infrastructure investments. I appreciate the mayor and uh, the port's director and chief executive officer, uh, Heidi Webb, and the rest of the team at Port Miami for hosting us. I'd like to welcome our witnesses joining us today. We will have a hearing testimony from three panels. Our first panel we'll have is Representative Mario de Les Bart, who represents Florida's 26th Congressional District. Second panel, we have Rear Admiral John Van, Commander of Coast Guard Cyber Command. Rear Admiral Wayne Arg Arguin, Jr., who is Coast Guard Assistant Com uh, Commandant for Prevention Policy, and uh, William Pope, Associate Administrator for Ports and Waterways for the Maritime Administration. Third panel will be, we'll hear from James Fowler, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Crowley Shipping, Frederick Wong, Jr., Deputy Port Disaster, uh, Director of Port Miami, uh, Brent Sadler, Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, Ed McCarthy, Chief Operating Officer of Georgia Ports Authority, and Dave Morgan, President and Chief Executive Officer of Cooper Ports America. Thank you all for being witnesses here and joining us today. Cargo activity in the United States uh, ports is crucial to our nation's commerce and accounts for 26% of our nation, nation's GDP, generating nearly $5.4 trillion in total economic activity and supporting 31 million direct and indirect jobs. To protect the, this crucial economic engine, we need to make the nece uh, necessary investments and ensure our ports are effectively confront the physical and cyber threats. Uh, the Marine Transportation Security Act was passed in the wake of 9-11 and was originally envisioned to guard primarily against physical threats. Uh, however, as technology and automation became more ingrained into the port operation, the risk of cyber attacks grows. For example, we know that from public reporting that one of America's largest ports, the Port of Los Angeles, faces approximately 40 million cyber attacks uh, per month. At the same time, we must also confront the reality of China's influence in the maritime domain, is, and it's growing, and if left uh, unchecked, threats to overthrow or, up or, disru uh, or disrupt 
uh, impediments to the maritime transportation sector. Uh, major port equipment such as terminal cranes are purchased from China and could present uh, serious vulnerabilities to the supply chain. Uh, Loglink logistics management system developed by China, China provides, uh, provides shipment tracking and other logistical services so while collecting significant amounts of data that could uh, be used for malign purposes or to gain unfair economic advantage. I'm pleased that the subcommittee is able to work together to include language in last year's NDAA that provides critical protections against this. In the wake of the global supply chain crisis that caused significant disruptions to commerce, it's critical that our ports and just as importantly, the intermodal connections that connect our ports to inland cargo destinations have learned from the experiences during the pandemic. And we're working to increase uh, the resiliency and supply of the supply chain. Look forward to hearing from our witnesses on how port infrastructure development grant funding uh, is improving the efficient movement of goods and through, uh, through our ports. And I look forward to learning how operations within the supply chain are uh, migrating the risk of mitigating, I'm sorry, mitigating the risk of another supply chain crisis and making the maritime transportation system more resilient to future disruptions. With that, I recognize our ranking member, uh, Mr. Carvajal, for his opening statement for five minutes. You recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Chair Webster, and Chair Jimenez for gathering us here today in this beautiful, beautiful uh, place called Miami for this important bipartisan uh, joint hearing focus on our port. I also want to extend uh, thanks to the mayor for coming out and welcoming us and to my other colleague who will be providing testimony, Representative diaz Balart. You certainly live in a great place, a wonderful piece of paradise in our country. Uh, I live in the other paradise, uh, Santa Barbara, California. Uh, but I wanted to make one observation before I start my testimony. It seems that the Democrats are not wearing ties today. And all my Republican colleagues, especially from Miami, are wearing ties. I'm just wondering, what is the best way to do Miami? You know, I'm a little confused. Um, last week, when a container ship struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, the world saw how easily a major port can come grinding to a stop. I express my sincere condolences to the families of the construction crew who lost their lives. The collapse of the key bridge exposed vulnerabilities and created an economic catastrophe for the country. When a major port shutters, shock waves are felt nationwide. Locally, thousands of individuals depend on a port for their livelihoods and will be out of work. Further away, farmers and miners are also affected as their product will not leave the docks. Baltimore is also the largest car port in the country, which will certainly affect the market for vehicles. The United States has more than 300 ports nationwide, and more than 95% of all cargo spends time on a ship. The U.S. economy depends on our ports. Ports are intermodal connectors, integrating water, rail, road, and airborne modes of transportation. Over 11 million containers move through U.S. ports each year. Ports face both physical and cybersecurity threats on a daily basis. The Coast Guard holds the responsibility to review port security plans, respond to cyber attacks, and monitor daily traffic entering and exiting the ports. President Biden recently signed an executive order strengthening the Coast Guard's authority to respond to cyber events at ports. This comes at an important time as ports are receiving thousands of cyber attacks each year. I am interested in hearing from the Coast Guard how they plan to utilize this executive order and strengthen cybersecurity. Our ports must be resilient to all threats. Climate change and sea level rise pose one of the largest threats of our generation and can cause an equally devastating disruption to the supply chain. That is why Congress worked together to include over $2.25 billion 
for Port Infrastructure Development Program in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law aimed at decarbonizing and making ports more resilient. It's my understanding this port in Miami is moving to our, towards having short side power in the very near future. Ports are vital to our economy and national security. I welcome today's conversation as to how to continue to support our ports and make them more resilient. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Now I recognize the Chairman of the Transportation and Maritime Security Subcommittee, Mr. Jimenez, for five minutes opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And on behalf of my constituents in the 28th District of Florida, I would like to welcome my colleagues and our distinguished witnesses to Miami. Um, I don't know, Mario, why are we wearing ties? I, I really don't <laughs> get it, okay? Um, I didn't know y'all had them. Yeah, well, we found a couple, I think, yeah. uh, and so we, we put it on just to impress you all. But uh, normally here, especially in the summer, we, we don't go around. We, we have something called a guayabera. Uh, if you're Latin, that uh, that we use uh, for formal for formal uh, things, but uh, I, I'm I'm with you, uh, ranking ranking member. It's, it's a little too formal for me. All right, but anyway, I digress. Today, our guests will uh, further learn what I have long known that Miami is a unique, robust, beautiful city uh, that has much to offer to both its residents and and its visitors. Our this venue, Port Miami, is the busiest passenger cruise uh, port in the entire world, not just, not just in the um, in United States, but in the entire world. And it's one of the busiest cargo ports in the, in the United States. I'm excited to, to use this hearing to further examine the integral role it plays in our city and more broadly our country. And the mayor has already touched about, uh, on how important this port is to the economy of, uh, of, my, of this city and uh, South Florida in general, over 300,000 jobs are either directly or indirectly related to this port. It's the second largest econo economic generator in this area. This and the airport uh, combine for probably over 600,000 uh, either direct or indirect jobs. First, I'd like to offer my sincere condolences uh, to the families of the individuals who passed away or were negatively impacted by the tragic collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Um, last week and express my gratitude to the men and women of the United States Coast Guard and other federal, state, and local authorities who, are res who responded to the incident. While we're not aware of any malicious uh, responsibilities for the incident, the severity of the collapse of the bridge underscores the importance uh, of what we're discussing today. Before I was elected to Congress, uh, I had the distinct uh, uh, honor to serve 25 years as a firefighter uh, with the City of Miami, later serving as its chief. Uh, I then had the privilege of, uh, of being the city manager of the City of Miami. And then finally, I served as the mayor of Miami-Dade County. Uh, it was during my, the, my time as mayor of Miami-Dade that I saw the critical impact that the Port Miami and maritime born trade has on Miami and the state of Florida. Our port here is not only a hub of commerce, it's a gateway to the world. Major disruptions at the port uh, operations, like what we're witnessing in Baltimore, would severely harm the local economy and hinder the region's connectivity to the rest of the United States and beyond. It is for that reason I worked hard during my tenure as mayor of Miami-Dade and will continue to do so in my current capacity to ensure Port Miami and the nation's port have what it needs, uh, what they need to operate safely, effectively, and securely. In my current role as chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee's Transportation and Maritime Security Subcommittee, I am continuously concerned by the security threats facing maritime ports across the country. I'm especially worried by the security vulnerabilities that exist with port equipment that is manufactured or installed at, in the People's Republic of China. The ship to shore cranes uh, hovering over our docks, including the ones here, while instrumental to our, our port operations are a focal point, point of that concern. Most of the U.S port-to-ship uh, cranes, nearly 80 percent, are made by CPMC, a Chinese state-owned enterprise under the direct control of the Chinese Communist Party. This near monopoly allows for CPMC to compromise U.S.-bound cranes that could cause malfunctions or facilitate cyber espionage at U.S. ports. This situation not only presents cybersecurity threats but also supply chain vulnerabilities that could be exploited by those who wish to inflict damage to our nation and could have lasting impacts. 
Unfortunately, Communist China's influence in the supply chain extends beyond state enterprises like CPMC. Third-party companies often create the internal operational components for these ship-to-shore cranes. These components include programmable logic controllers, which control many ship-to-shore crane systems, as well as crane drives and motors. In most all cases, CPMC requires, and I repeat, requires that these companies ship their components to the PRC where they can be installed by CPMC engineers or technicians. As my uh, subcommittee has discussed in previous hearings, the proliferation of port equipment operational technology manufactured or installed by engineers in the PRC introduces significant supply chain vulnerabilities into our maritime transportation system. As a country, we must acknowledge and assess these risks, threats, and vulnerabilities and decide how to effectively respond. In February, the Biden administration signed an executive order providing the U.S. Coast Guard with new authority to respond to potential malicious actors targeting our maritime sector, and particularly those from the PRC. While I commend the administration on this initial action, I believe we need to continue examining this critical topic and ensure that our ports are protected from security threats. To do so, I have brought together a group of members from the China Select Committee and the Committee of Homeland Security to investigate some of the vulnerabilities associated with the PRC manufactured port cranes and the consequences of having a supply chain that is over, overly reliant upon equipment sourced from our greatest geopolitical opponent. Additionally, I have instructed legislative solutions such as my Port Crane Security and Inspection Act to ensure that the U.S. Coast Guard and other federal agencies responsible for safeguarding maritime ports have the tools and authorities necessary to deter hostile actors from operating against our ports. I am glad to be participating in today's hearings in which you allow us to continue to address this critical topic and deliver a strong message to our adversaries interested in meddling in our ports and in the United States in, particular, in, in general. Thank you, and I yield back. I now recognize the ranking member of the Transportation and Maritime Security Subcommittee, Mr. Tendar, for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to all. I'm used to coming here not only not in my tie, but also bringing my family, my children, who are excited to go on the, po on the cruise. Uh, you know, this is the only time I'm here working in this beautiful building and this beautiful city. Uh, but before I begin my remarks, I would like to thank uh, Port Miami for hosting us today. Thank you also to Chairman Jimenez for hosting us in your hometown. And thank you, Chairman Webster and Ranking Member Carvajal for bringing our two subcommittees together for this important hearing. Finally, thank you all of our witnesses today for sharing your time and expertise with us. The past couple of weeks have been displayed the importance of safe and secure functioning of our nation's maritime ports and the marine transportation system. As we all are aware, on March 26, a container ship crashed into the Francis Scott key bridge in Baltimore, causing the bridge to collapse, claiming the lives of six men who were working on the bridge. My heart goes out to the friends and families of the victims of this tragic accident. In the aftermath of the bridge's collapse, the port of Baltimore was forced to shut down all maritime traffic in and out of the port. The incidents has demonstrated how critical a single port's operation can be to the whole economy as industries and communities throughout the country have felt the impact of the port's closure, including the automotive industry in my hometown of Detroit. But while the incidents has highlighted some of the vulnerabilities of our maritime sector, it has also displayed its tremendous resilience. The Coast Guard, along with a host of federal, state, and local partners, has worked diligently around the clock to respond to the accident, carry out search and rescue mission, 
access the damage, contain hazardous material, and begin to clear the waterways. Thanks to their hard work, a temporary channel has already been cleared, allowing the port to reopen to limited traffic. I'm grateful to all the first responders who have worked to save lives and limit the damage caused by the ex accident. Today we will discuss what more can be done to ensure the safe and secure operation of our nation's seaports and prevent further disruption to the marine transportation system. We must ensure that congested waterways can be navigated safely and since accidents will happen regardless, we must develop better ways to protect infrastructure and prevent catastrophic damage. And while there is absolutely no evidence that the accident in Baltimore was caused by any kind of cyber or physical attack, threats to the maritime sector are very real, and we must ensure the Coast Guard and its partners have the resources and the tools needed to counter them. As computer systems and networks have grown increasingly prevalent within ports, addressing cyber threats has become especially critical. Cyber attacks on ports in the U.S. and overseas have already had drastic impacts stalling the transport of cargo and costing hundreds of millions of dollars in economic damage. In February, the Biden administration announced a series of actions to greatly enhance port cybersecurity, including an executive order to address Coast Guard authorities and cyber incident reporting, proposed regulations to establish minimum port cybersecurity requirements, a security directive to address vulnerabilities posed by Chinese manufactured cranes, and an investment of more than $20 billion to improve port infrastructure and initiative, initiate domestic manufacturing of cranes. These actions will significantly improve port cybersecurity. I look forward to hearing more from our witnesses on what support is needed to carry out these actions and on other efforts to ensure the safety and security of our nation's seaport. Thank you again to our host, our witnesses, and Chairman Ail back. Thank you, and we have, uh, as we've said, three, three different panels, but before we begin those, I'd like to take a moment to explain our lighting system. Green means go, and yellow means slow up, red means stop, kind of like a stoplight. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that witnesses that are full, uh, full testimonies be in full statements be included in the record. That objection show that ordered. I ask for unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as the witnesses and all panels have, uh, have provided answers to any questions that may have been submitted in writing. That objection show that ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for additional comments and information submitted by the members uh, or the witnesses to be included in the record in today's hearing. That objection, show that order. Uh, as your written testimony has been made part of the record, we ask that you limit your remarks to five minutes. With that, um, that, uh, with that being said, uh, we'll start with our first witness, which is Representative Mayor, uh, <laughs> Mario diaz Bellart, a uh, good friend of mine. We served together in the State House, State Senate, and now yeah. in Congress. And as, uh, in Congress is recognized as probably one of the top members of Congress. So thank you. You're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, Chairman, Ranking Member, this is a very distinguished panel. Uh, and uh, I am honored uh, that you would all be here. Uh, in South Florida. Uh, to you, uh, Mr. Webster, Chair, uh, Mr. Chairman, you and I have worked on issues dealing with infrastructure now going back to, well, we'd rather not talk about how long. But I will tell you that this state and the country is better off because of the service, Mr. Chairman, 
that you have provided. Your leadership on infrastructure issues and other issues, but in particular on infrastructure issues, uh, has been frankly remarkable. Uh, and we are in this beautiful port, Miami, uh, but I, I can't help to think of all you have done going back to the state legislative years, and you know I worked on those things together, but your leadership there and you continue your leadership on making sure that the ports of this state uh, and now nationally are, are the best they can be. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your invaluable service uh, to this amazing country of ours. And I would be remiss, and I, I'm not, because I have a lot of friends in this panel, but, uh, but I do want to mention um, Chairman Jimenez. Chairman Jimenez uh, is obviously a you know, distinguished member of the TNI Committee, also of the Homeland Security, and also of the China Committee. But uh, as I'm sure you know, he's also uh, a bit of an institution in our community here. A firefighter, career firefighter, then, then fire chief, and uh, going all the way to mayor. And I would tell you, I, I don't mean this to as, as disrespectful to any mayor before or after uh, Mr. Jimenez, but uh, but this community and, and the infrastructure in this area had not has not been better uh, than when Mr. Jimenez was chairman was uh, mayor, uh, and he continues to serve and he's a valuable asset I know to your committee, Mr. Chairman, to your committee uh, ranking members, uh, and and again it's a privilege, uh, Mayor, Chief and friend and colleague uh, to be uh, here with you. Uh, I, I, I did, Mr. Chairman, uh, submit a rather extensive uh, statement. So I just want to touch a, a couple of issues on my uh, Again, also thank you all of you for mentioning the tragedy in Baltimore. Uh, we are in this beautiful place that all of you have talked about. You know, the, the amazing thing about Port Miami is that it's a very small port. It's landlocked, and yet it does amazing things for this community, for the state, for the country, in a very small uh, footprint. And uh, every port in the country is different. And this is one of those examples of a port that, that is on the cutting edge. And without this port, frankly, this community would not be able to be this thriving community that we all see and that we all cherish. And some of us are, are privileged to live in. Uh, I'm very proud that, uh, that as a former chairman of the THUD uh, Transportation Housing Subcommittee of Appropriations, I'm still on that, uh, I was able to create and fund, actually probably more important right, than creating, the Port Infrastructure Development Program, uh, specifically for seaports. As you know, seaports have always had to compete for funding from everything, for, they have to compete with everything else. And they still do in other areas, but at least we have this program, and I just want to emphasize that because all of us have to be very supportive of making sure that we continue to emphasize seaports because they are such a vital part of our community. Uh, also something a little unique about this port, and frankly, this community, is that um, we are affected greatly, other ports and other communities are as well, but but by what happens in this region and in this hemisphere. We've all seen the tragic situation taking place in Haiti, for example, right now. Uh, and it is tragic. And I will tell you that whatever happens in places like Haiti, or we're in a hurricane area, this whole hemisphere is, and where, when there's a hurricane, <laughs> this seaport also becomes a hub for humanitarian relief around the entire hemisphere. But I also want to talk about another little issue uh, that is a little unique for Port Miami and for this part of the state, this part of the country. We happen to be sitting 90 miles away from a state sponsor of terrorism. Think about that. 90 miles away from us, there is a dictatorship, by the way, that has troops fighting along with the Russians in the Ukraine. <laughs> that has uh, what the OAS Secretary General has called an army of occupation in Venezuela, just 90 miles away from us. And so when, we, you're, when we're dealing with security and safety, which is an issue that I know that you all are looking at, uh, one of the things to remember is that while every port has its challenges, this port and this community and this area has some unique challenges. And that sometimes I think uh, are either forgotten or ignored. Uh, I was outraged, by the way, when the U.S. 
uh, Department of State. I deal with them all the time in coordination with the Department of Homeland Security approved, recently approved a visit for members of the, that terrorist regime um, to go visit the port of, of uh, Wilmington in North Carolina. Uh, don't take my word for it. The representative who represents that area, uh, Mr. Chairman Rouser, uh, was equally incensed. Um, and furthermore, to just show you sometimes how uh, folks can be totally tone deaf. Uh, what, one of the things that was mentioned by the Department of State during that so-called visit uh, was that the delegation was meeting with uh, the Cuban counterparts in the United States, the U.S. Coast Guard, the counterparts. With all due respect, the U.S. Coast Guard are heroes. They sacrifice, they risk their lives to protect commerce, to protect the environment, to protect the American people, and frankly, people from all over the world. And to say that, that the thugs of the Cuban regime are counterparts to the U.S. Coast Guard not only shows a lack of understanding on, of reality, but it's just an insult to the men and women, to the heroes of the United States Coast Guards. Uh, just one example, the so-called counterparts, the Cuban regime's counterparts, remember they were responsible for the horrific tugboat massacre um, um, where they on purpose sank and murdered and with hoses actually hosed babies and kids, men and women, into the ocean who drowned and they sank a, to a, coast guard, a, a, a tugboat uh, on purpose. To call those folks the counterparts of the U.S. Coast Guard is not only insensitive and insulting, but it shows a lack of understanding of reality. So I am so grateful uh, for the fact that all of you are here. I'm grateful for your leadership. I'm grateful for uh, for what you do day in and day out. And I'm also incredibly privileged to have the opportunity to work with you all uh, as, as my role as an appropriator. And I thank you all. And I know that I've gone way over my time, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for that. Uh, that's what happens when you wear a tie. You go over the line, you see? So anyways, uh, thank you for your kindness, for your indulgence. I yield back. Okay, does anybody on the panel have a question for Representative diaz Bellart? You recognize Mr. Cohen. Thank you. Uh, I am not a subcommittee chairman of the relevant committee, but I am the senior member of this delegation, and I feel like Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> Moving right along with our bombastic review, I want to express my sincere care for our colleague, Representative diaz Bellart. He's a good guy. We've been on travels together and got to be friends and bonded and continue, and he does a great job. Uh, he brought up the issue about Ukraine. I hope we get a vote when we come back next week to support the Ukrainians who are valiantly fighting to maintain democracy, to fight off an authoritarian attack by Russia, just as many in Cuba did when Castro came, and I hope we get that vote. And uh, right now, you know, the Cuban soldiers who were there are having a pretty free reign in killing Ukrainians because they got the bullets and the Ukrainians don't. So I hope that happens. And, and, and then on a bit of personal privilege, my staff emailed me and they didn't say anything about me not having a tie. They said, I like your shirt. <laughs> Shirts are good. Uh, I'd also like to give note that I'm a 1967 graduate of Coral Gables High School. I'm probably the, maybe the only, other than Mr. Jimenez, graduate of a Dade County High School in the Congress. Uh, and I was a Cavalier, and I went to Ponce Jr., and loved Miami, and still love Miami. It's changed a lot since I was here. Uh, I've visited many times, but when I was here in this growing up, it's changed a ton. And I've just learned that Mr. Jimenez and I have much in common. Sonny Liston and Cassius Clay and Joe Auer and so much else, and we'll have lots of time to talk about George Meyer in the future. Thank you, and it's good to be back in Miami. And also, for Mr. Carbajal's note, 
and he may not know this, and it may be an old thing, C-A-L-I-F. That's, Mr. Carbajal, that's abbreviation for California, is it not? It could be. You know, when I was growing up, they told me that meant come and live in Florida. I yield. <laughs> Mr. Chair, now we know who to blame for the taste in shirt that Mr. Cohen is wearing. Yes, for sure. Are there any questions for Representative diaz Bilar from the panel here? Okay, well, that brings to the close of the first panel. Thank you for appearing. Uh, Representative diaz Bilar. thank you for your insight. We really appreciate it. You are excused. So our second panel today consists of the executive branch government witnesses, which are uh, Rear Admiral Van. You are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Webster, Chairman Jimenez, Ranking Member Carbajal, Ranking Member Tanadar, distinguished members of the subcommittees. I am honored to be here today to discuss the protection, defense, and resiliency of the Marine Transportation System, the MTS, from today's cyber threats. I ask that my written testimony be entered into the record. So ordered. First and foremost, I would like to express my deepest sympathies to the six individuals who lost their lives in the terrible accident involving the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The Coast Guard's thoughts are with their loved ones during this difficult time. Furthermore, my thanks go out to Coast Guard, the Coast Guard men and women and the many agencies and organizations that continue to heroically respond to that tragic accident. The Coast Guard is committed to addressing cybersecurity risks and responding to cyber incidents in the marine environment to ensure our nation's economic and national security. The size, interdependence, complexity, and criticality of the MTS make it a prime target for criminals, activists, terrorists, state-sponsored actors, and adversarial nation states. The threat of disruptive cyber effects to our critical infrastructure and specifically to the MTS, require us to be vigilant, proactive, collaborative, and resourceful. Cyber intrusions and attacks have a devastating impact on critical infrastructure. A successful cyber attack could impose unrecoverable losses to port operations and electronically stored information, hampering national economic activity and disrupting global supply chains. The increased use of automated systems in shipping, offshore platforms, and port and cargo facilities creates enormous efficiencies and introduces additional attack vectors for malicious cyber actors. With the support of Congress, the Coast Guard has invested in growing and maturing Coast Guard Cyber Command to assess, identify, and respond to cyber risks and threats. CG Cyber currently employs three cyber protection teams, or CPTs, and a maritime cyber readiness branch. The CPTs work with local Coast Guard captains of the port to address cybersecurity risks and respond to cyber threats in the MTS. A Coast Guard CPT was the first federal cyber response team in 2021 to identify probable port network intrusion by a People's Republic of China actor known now as Volt Typhoon. 
our ability to share information and critical vulnerabilities with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, and law enforcement partners enabled a timely response and rapid mitigation with that port partner. The Maritime Cyber Readiness Branch employs subject matter experts in cybersecurity and marine safety. They regularly engage with industry, support area maritime security committees for planning and execution of cyber exercises, and work with MTS cybersecurity specialists at each Coast Guard area, district, and sector to improve cyber literacy and support Coast Guard captains of the port in measuring cyber risk. We will soon be releasing the third annual Cyber Trends and Insights in the Marine Environment Report, which provides key insights and trends to aid industry and other stakeholders in identifying and addressing current and emerging cyber risks. Through consistent work in collaboration with other departments, agencies, and industry, CG Cyber shares critical vulnerability information, mitigation strategies, and threat intelligence. Our CPTs regularly deploy with Department of Defense and CISA teams to provide maritime and operational technology subject matter expertise around the globe. We are better and more resilient because we exercise and execute operations together. I look forward to continuing this conversation and answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next we have Rear Admiral Arquin. You, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Webster, Chairman Jimenez, Ranking Member Carbajal, Ranking Member Tanadar, and Congressman Cohen. I'm honored to be here today to discuss a top priority for the United States Coast Guard, protecting the marine transportation system. I ask that my written testimony be entered into the record. So ordered. I'd like to offer my heartfelt condolences to the families and loved ones of the six individuals who lost their lives in the tragic incident involving the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Much like, uh, much like in South Florida, the Coast Guard has strong ties throughout Maryland and the Baltimore region, and our sympathies are with all those impacted by this horrible incident. Our national security and economic prosperity are inextricably linked to a safe, secure, and efficient marine transportation system, or MTS. The vast system of ports and waterways that make up the MTS supports $5.4 trillion of annual economic activity, accounts for the employment of more than 30 million Americans, and enables critical sea lift capabilities, allowing our armed forces to project power around the globe. Florida is a shining example of the benefits brought by a vibrant MTS, employing more than 65,000 men and women and contributing approximately 15 billion to the state's economy. The increasing connectedness and complexity of the nation's MTS also brings new vulnerabilities and threats, including in the cyber domain. In response to dynamic threats, the United States Coast Guard has taken decisive action in our maritime critical infrastructure to harden and build resiliency against cyber attacks. On February 21st, the President signed an executive order which further enables our port security efforts by explicitly addressing cyber threats. It empowers the Coast Guard to prescribe conditions and restrictions for the safety of waterfront facilities and vessels and ports, including re reporting requirements for actual or threatened cyber incidents. With this authority, the Coast Guard issued a directive requiring specific risk management actions for all owners and operators of cranes manufactured by companies from the People's Republic of China. While the specific requirements are deemed sensitive security information and cannot be shared publicly, our captains of the port around the country are working directly with crane owners and operators to ensure compliance. Also on February 21st, the Coast Guard released a proposed rulemaking to set baseline cybersecurity requirements for vessels, facilities, and outer, con outer continental shelf facilities. The public comment period for the proposed rule is open and the service stresses the need for public participation in the proposed rulemaking. The diversity of the maritime industry and the dynamic nature of the cyber threat make public comment critical. While the Coast Guard is focused on implementing these new major efforts, work is far from done. The MTS is indeed a system where an attack on one segment has the potential to affect others. This demands collabor collaboration across government and industry to ensure a unified and coordinated response to cyber challenges in the maritime domain. Like all other risks to the MTS, cyber risk is a shared responsibility. As such, the Coast Guard will continue its work across all levels of government 
and engage with industry to assess security vulnerabilities, determine risk, and develop mitigation strategies. This layered approach from the local to international level is critical due to the size, diversity, and interconnectedness of the MTS. As the proven prevention and response framework is applied to prevent or minimize disruptions to the MTS in ports around the country, I'm grateful for the support of this committee to ensure the Coast Guard has the authorities and the resources we need to stay ahead of these threats. I look forward to your questions on the vital work the Coast Guard does every day to help safeguard America's ports. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and, I look, uh, and for your continued support of the United States Coast Guard. Thank you. Now, Mr. Hoppe. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, Chairman Webster, Chairman Jimenez, Ranking Member Carvajal, Ranking Member Tanadar, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for your tremendous support for the Maritime Administration, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the Port Infrastructure Development Program, or PIDP, which is a discretionary grant program and its role in bolstering the safety and security of our nation's ports. Before I go further, allow me to express on behalf of the Department of Transportation our condolences to the families of those who lost their lives last week when the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed. I also want to express thanks to the United States Coast Guard for spearheading the federal response at the Port of Baltimore and to all of our federal partners, as well as Maryland State and local officials, for their ongoing response to the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Times like this highlight how important our maritime transportation system is to our economic and national security. Merit promotes the development and maintenance of a resilient maritime transportation system, including ports by providing grants for infrastructure projects, technical assistance, and support for port security initiatives. The Port Infrastructure Development Program is Merit's largest discretionary grant program. The primary objective of PIDP is to enhance the safety, efficiency, or reliability of the movement of goods into, out of, around, or within a port. PIDP grants support efforts by ports and industry stakeholders to improve port and related freight infrastructure to meet the nation's freight transportation needs and ensure our port infrastructure can meet the anticipated growth in freight volumes. In fiscal year 23, Merritt received 153 eligible applications for PIDP from projects across 37 states and four U.S. territories with a combined funding request exceeding $2.8 billion, with only $662 million available. Merit awarded grants to fund 41 port infrastructure projects across the nation, including several notable PIDP projects that focused on safety improvements across various ports. These numbers vividly demonstrate the oversubscription of this grant program and highlights the continued urgent need for measures to help continue strengthening the nation's supply chains. On the technical assistance front, Merritt chairs the National Port Readiness Network to ensure readiness of commercial strategic seaports to support deployment of military forces and national contingencies. Together with eight other federal agencies and military commands, this network supports the maintenance of port readiness committees. Merritt further facilitates the collaborative development of port readiness plans, which are voluntary planning documents focused on port facility readiness at commercial strategic seaports. As our, current policy, as our current port security initiative, the FY24 PIDP Notice of Funding Opportunity included two critical provisions addressing cybersecurity and technology concerns. First, the Notice of Funding Opportunity prohibits the use or provision of LOGINC. This measure aims to safeguard against potential security risks associated with this, these platforms. The second provision seeks to ensure projects are consistent with Presidential Policy 20, Directive 21 critical infrastructure security and resilience, and that each application selected for federal funding must demonstrate consideration and mitigation of physical and cyber security risks relevant to their project. Projects failing to adequately address these risks will be required to do so before receiving funds. Finally, the FY23 NDAA directed MARAD, in consultation with our other federal stakeholders, to conduct a study to assess whether there are cyber security or national security risks posed by foreign manufactured cranes at United States ports. Our report will be de delivered to Congress soon. In conclusion, PIDP plays a vital role in enhancing the safety, efficiency, reliability, and resilience of our nation's ports. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before this subcommittee and thank you for the support you have shown the Maritime Administration. I welcome any questions that you may have. 
Thank you all for your testimony. And now we turn to uh, members from the for the second panel, uh, questions for them, and uh, I recognize myself for five minutes. Rear Admiral Van, uh, the Maritime Transportation System Security Act was approved by Congress in 2002. At the time, there was physical problems, and uh, the, those were looked into. Now uh, we have cyber problems, and do you think the um, the uh, Coast Guard has the right authority and so forth in striking a balance between cyber and physical threats? Chairman Webster, uh, I'll, I'll uh, take a, an attempt to answer your question and then uh, maybe ask my, my colleague here who, who's really, uh, this is his area of expertise. But uh, to your point, clearly uh, cyber threats and the risks of, of cyber attack have increased over time with the advance of technology, particularly in the uh, port environment with the uh, implementation of automation and, and uh, various uh, software products, uh, operational technology to increase the efficiency of our ports. What comes with that are increased vulnerabilities uh, and, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, attack vectors. Uh, our authorities, uh, which will be bolstered uh, by the, the current uh, rulemaking effort, uh, are are currently adequate for our team's abilities to assist port partners in addressing risks and responding to attacks. Uh, I will uh, I'll defer to uh, Admiral Argwin to uh, add Admiral to the Ar answer. Argwin, you, do you have something to add to that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so uh, to answer your question uh, directly, the Marine Transportation Security Act uh, did support or did solve a particular problem when initially um, uh, enacted and focus primarily on physical security. However, the evolving threats um, that have been brought about with the cyber domain, um, we are evolving those same authorities. We can use that same structure. Uh, and our, our proposed rulemaking really does focus on uh, evolving the, the requirements that we are putting in place through those baseline cybersecurity requirements to address the emerging threats that cyber uh, places. So I would say that we are good on the physical side with, uh, with MTSA evolving to incorporate um, vulnerability closing uh, actions underneath MTSA is still appropriate. Yes, sir. So were, were there more that you might need for the, um, for the uh, cyber part of that as far as uh, the Coast Guard needing more authority for port safety and so forth, do you think? Mr. Chairman, I would say that the framework, the structural framework, that system that was put in place underneath uh, the MTSA is adequate. The authorities that we have underneath the Captain of the Port Authorities to be able to address those emerging threats is adequate. We need to build out the specifics, which is where the notice to propose rulemaking really does focus on setting that baseline. But the cyber, the cyber challenge really is an evolving challenge that we're going to have to be nimble and flexible as new vulnerabilities are identified, but I, I feel very confident that the structure and the system that's in place underneath MTSA is adequate for the purposes of addressing those vulnerabilities. So Rear Admiral Van, uh, in February, the President signed an executive order to strengthen cybersecurity in the maritime domain. Uh, the Coast Guard has historically been uh, uh, sometimes slow to respond to uh, rule, doing executive orders and rulemaking and so forth. For example, we spent a decade trying to execute rules for the Atlantic uh, Coast port access routes. Cybersecurity is rapidly developing. Do you think the, that uh, the Coast Guard will have the speed to put together what's needed in order to do that? Or do you, are they going to adopt a slower, slower speed? Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the executive order uh, clarified captain of the port authorities to respond to cyber threats and attacks uh, immediately as soon as it was instituted. Uh, as you know, sir, that same day, uh, the Coast Guard released a, a maritime security directive that specifically addressed the assessment of vulnerabilities in uh, foreign-made ship-to-shore cranes. So again, that was an immediate response. And then uh, that same week was the notice of proposed rulemaking, which, to your point, sir, there is a process that plays out. We are in the public comment period, 
and the Coast Guard encourages uh, industry and, and port partners to take advantage of the opportunity to provide feedback on the draft uh, regulations that have been uh, put forward through that rulemaking process. So mo moving with haste, sir. Okay, Mr. Carvajal, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Papp, as we so tragically witnessed in Baltimore, the continuous operation of our ports should not be taken for granted. What is Merritt doing to help ports become more resilient to rising oceans and extreme weather events? Sorry, I thank you for that question. Um, we are taking a number of actions, but I think it, uh, I would like to take that question for the record. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rear Admiral Van, uh, President Biden issued an executive order granting the Coast Guard stronger authorities to address cybersecurity. So building on what my colleague just asked, how is the Coast Guard using this new authority and to explain how this differs from the existing authority the Coast Guard already had. Ranking Member, appreciate that question. Uh, as I indicated before, the executive order was uh, a clarification of our Magnuson Act authorities where the captain of the port has the authority to respond to th risks and, and threats and attacks, be they, be they physical, be they uh, any, any threat, this executive order added cyber to clarify, to your point, existing authorities. So the way we are using those authorities is uh, continuing to do our mission in, in prevention. And then as cyber threats emerge or attacks occur, uh, we would, captains of the port could leverage that authority that comes with the executive order to respond by, uh, by uh, directing the movement or the, the operations of port operations of vessels. Um, as I mentioned in my previous answer, one of the first actions we took was a maritime security directive in association with the executive order uh, to direct the assessment of, of port cranes uh, due to that, uh, the criticality of that node of the system and the, uh, the uh, prevalence of foreign manufactured cranes. So th these are actions that uh, we've taken and that we are poised to take should there be uh, a threat or an attack that occurs. Thank you. Admiral Arguin, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for your commitment to addressing sexual assault and sexual harassment in the commercial maritime industry. Your efforts have not gone, not gone unnoticed among merchant mariners, the very people who need your help. How would you assess the state of change in the industry and how far do we still have to go? Uh, ranking member, uh, thank you for, for the compliment, but it is a team sport. Um, we, have, um, we have taken um, directed efforts to engage with uh, maritime training providers, with uh, industry representatives, seafarers uh, around the nation to ensure that everyone understands their responsibilities uh, to change the culture associated with, with maritime. I think this is not a, there's not a finish line associated with, um, with changing a culture. It is an expectation that there is a, there is a, uh, there is an, a culture that is established to ensure that every single person feels safe coming to work and that they feel valued. And so that's going to be a continuous assessment of culture. And, and we really get to the point where what happens between two individuals in the engine room or on, in a, in a, on the bridge and that interaction where both people feel valued, feel respected, that's the, that really is the standard. And when that fails, um, or if that fails, that there's an expectation for accountability. And so that's going to be a continuous effort. I don't think we get to snap the chalk line and say we're done. I think that's going to be a continuous um, shared responsibility, not, with, not only just with, uh, with industry to change that culture, but then to ensure that if that culture does not stand forward, we, uh, we are in a position to hold individuals accountable. With organizational leadership changes that occur, I would submit to you that real cultural change will be determined on the systems changes that occur within the organization. So as leadership changes, those are sustainable. 
And so I encourage you to look at it from that perspective. Getting achievements now is one thing, but making sure the culture is ever evolving to ensure we don't have what we've had in the past continue. So thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Imanez, you're recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Mr. Pappas, um, or anybody can, can answer this, in light of, of what happened in, in Baltimore, um, and that was, right now it looks like uh, every indication was a, it was an accident. Um, what other ports, how many ports do we have in the United States that are vulnerable to such an either an accident or uh, a, um, or a, uh, um, an attack that's actually not an accident? So um, how many ports in the United States would be vulnerable to such a thing where a ship strikes a bridge, the bridge collapses, and then the, basically the port is out of, out of commission? How many ports do we have like that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll take a first shot at that. I, I would say that every port is vulnerable. I, I think uh, given the cyber, um, the cyber challenges uh, and the interconnectedness, the continued interconnectedness of, uh, of the marine transportation system and the inherent vulnerabilities with that, that uh, interconnectedness, that we have to be ever vigilant to tr continuously evolve um, uh, efforts to close those vulnerabilities. Specific to number of ports that may have um, infrastructure that could impact uh, or, or cause the closure of, uh, of a particular port, I don't have particular numbers, but I think anything that crosses a waterway poses a particular hazard or threat, and we need to be evaluating on a regular basis, the uh, assessing those waterways as more congestion comes into our ports, we need to understand that and be nimble and flexible to be able to put uh, safeguards in place to ensure the safe and efficient uh, movement of commerce. Um, I think it would be wise for, for the Coast Guard to do an inventory of those critical ports that, that are critical to the security of the United States and see um, either by accident or by intentional act um, how you can, how those ports can be affected I mean, this, this accident in, in, in Baltimore is clear indication. One ship hits a bridge and the port is out of action for some time. Um, a foreign adversary could say, have a coordinated attack. And this is not far-fetched. I mean, this is what happened in 9-11, right? So coordinated attack to affect our ability to respond uh, around the world, especially our military around the world. Have we done such a anal analysis? And if we haven't, I think it should be done to say, okay, these these ports are vulnerable in this fashion to being shut down and affecting our ability as a country to respond around the world. Mr. Chairman, so just to, to be clear, we, uh, each of our sector commanders, our captains of port have real-time information on ongoing threats to threats and hazards within each of those ports and they are regularly assessing risks on a daily basis to to understand the impact to the marine transportation system a, a consolidated list of um, uh, single point failures within those ports I'll, I'll bring that back to the staff uh, to, to verify that we, we have done something like that but on a daily basis every one of our sector commanders is regularly assessing risks whether that's weather whether that's congestion whether that's impacts to uh, to the waterway due to uh, navigation challenges they're regularly assessing those ports to ensure that we can continue to move cargo on a on a daily basis they we certainly understand the the significance of the yeah, but in Baltimore did anybody assess the risk of, of a ship hitting that, that bridge and it ca uh, causing it to collapse? Did anybody do that? Uh, Look, I mean, you got, you got to think of the, of the stuff that's never happened before. What if? The what if? And I guess because that's my firefighter in me, what if? All right? It's better to prevent something than to say, oh, gee, look, it collapsed. Okay? It collapsed because it got struck by a ship. Was there anything you could have done to that bridge, fortified it, so that if it got struck by, by a ship, it would not have collapsed? Uh, as I'm not a bridge expert, sir, but I would certainly say that there, at the conclusion of the investigation, the causal factors and recommendations that will come through, uh, we'll take those into account. That's what I'm calling for. So those critical ports are critical to the security of the United States. 
that if somehow can be put knocked out of out of commission what are the ways that you can knock it out of commission and what are the things we need to do to make sure it's not not knocked out of commission before it actually happens um, you know I believe in Murphy's law right? and if, it, if anything and it doesn't mean everything's bad it just says anything that can happen will and obviously look it happened in Baltimore it could happen a ship lost power it hit the bridge the bridge collapsed could we have done something to make sure that even in the event of Murphy's Law taking effect, that we we had you know, protection around the bridge structure so that it would not collapse? Because now now the largest uh, you know uh, port for for vehicles in the United States is knocked out of action and it's going to hurt the economy. I'm worried more also about our ability to respond around the world and an adversary taking certain actions to make sure that we don't respond around the world because we do need maritime assets when we're responding around the world. That's my concern. That's all I'm putting on the table. Yes, sir. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Tandar, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Admiral Van, um, and all of you, thank you for your testimony here today. Uh, in the aftermath of the key bridge in accident, there has been a lot of conjecture about the cause of the accident, some of which has been widely irresponsible. I understand that the investigation is ongoing and you're limited in what you can share, but that said, can you say whether at this point there is any evidence at all that the accident was caused by a cyber attack? Ranking member, uh, as, as you know, uh, we have representation from Coast Guard Cyber Command on the Coast Guard's Marine Board of Investigation, which is working in partnership with the National Transportation Safety Board's investigation. Um, it is, as you said, sir, much too early in the process to know uh, the causal factors, but the reason for that subject matter expertise is to certainly to investigate the potential for, for that type of a causal factor, uh, some sort of a cyber uh, disruption. So uh, absolutely being considered and uh, re really too early, and, and I'm, I wouldn't be in a position to comment. All right, thank you so much. And Admiral Argon, the waterways near major ports are subject to significant congestion and obstacles that make safe navigation challenging. What are some of the initial lessons to be learned from the Key Bridge incident, both for vessel operators and for port operations? Ranking member, so ships that are, are moving throughout our ports, uh, there's, a, there's a shared and a layered approach. And there are a variety of different ways that we uh, attempt to prevent the bad thing from happening. And that, that involves skilled mariners uh, at the helm. It involves um, pilots that are uniquely positioned and experienced and operating in those particular waters. It's the inspection and investigation of vessels, the oversight of vessels to ensure that the systems that have been designed to meet certain requirements are effectively operating in the way that they're supposed to. It is the aids to navigation to ensure that the channel is properly marked. It's access to information. All of those uh, pieces of information come together um, to, to ensure that, that commerce can operate safely. And when, those, uh, when any one of those elements um, fails to meet expectations, being able to understand why that failed and then build resiliency into that system is important. And we constantly are looking at those, uh, those challenges on a regular daily basis at our captains of the port. Thank you, thank you, Admiral. And Admiral Argon and Admiral Van, um, I appreciate your testimony before our subcommittee on some of these same topics back in February. At that hearing, we discussed in details the actions the administration announced in February to bolster cybersecurity at ports. These actions will require significant effort from the Coast Guard to implement since the, that hearing, Congress passed funding for the reminder of the current fiscal year, and the President submitted his budget request for next year. Yesterday, for a better part of my, the day, I had the pleasure of meeting 
the officers um, of Coast Guard and uh, you know be on the water with them and I admire uh, their dedication and their service to our our nation and um, but I kept seeing uh, uh, you know the strong need for resources whether it was infrastructure needs whether it is needs for personnel uh, uh, you know as these challenges continue to grow uh, to have a well-funded well um, staffed uh, uh, Coast Guard is so important and that became very apparent as I was traveling through and working with them so what resources does the Coast Guard require to advance and then implement the rulemaking inspect for compliance and otherwise ensure the recently announced efforts and are carried out effectively. Does the Coast Guard's budget request include the necessary funding? Uh, ranking member, uh, so uh, we certainly appreciate um, the subcommittee and committee support, Congress's support for, uh, for Coast Guard budgets. Um, the Commandant's been very clear for the Coast Guard to meet its current and future demands, we need to be a $20 billion organization by 20, uh, 2033 to meet all of those requirements. And I think it's important to, to recognize that a predictable um, uh, level of funding gives us the opportunity to recapitalize our assets while also still meeting uh, emerging demands. And so um, the support uh, of Congress to ensure that is, uh, is paramount for us. Thank you. Anna, you back. Uh, gentleman yields back. Uh, Representative Cohen, are you, would you like five minutes? Seven. Okay, you can have five. <laughs> I'll take. I'll take four. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't really understand the answer to that question. How much more money does the Coast Guard need than what they were appropriated? You've been asked to do cybersecurity. You've got the awareness of. of bridges and other infrastructure vulnerable to massive ships and other forces. How much money do you need to protect the American maritime system beyond what you're getting? Here's your chance. Don't blow it. Co co Congressman, uh, as, as my colleague mentioned, uh, the, the fiscal 24 budget that was approved since we last appeared uh, before the committee and then uh, the president's budget that's been presented for next year and then looking ahead to 2033 uh, Commandant Fagan has been clear about uh, the, the current roughly 13 billion dollar Coast Guard being a, a 20 billion dollar Coast Guard and looking at a three to five percent increase in operating and maintenance funds annually uh, we've said that publicly in order to meet those requirements all those requirements you listed sir and many others um, to be specific about cyber, my area of responsibility, uh, I would tell you that we, we are meeting the, the, the current demand signal, but there's no doubt, I think in, uh, uh, anyone has, that these that cyber threats are increasing. Our increasing use of automation is creating more vulnerability. And so if we are asked to do more, uh, if our level of, if the required level of effort is going to go up, then the required level of resources would need to go up with it. So we will um, be responsible in, in asking for what we need as those responsibilities increase. It, it, either of y'all want to comment on this? A Congressman, a commandant's been very clear that the status quo is a risk position that we're in right now. Staying steady state uh, does not give uh, the Coast Guard the, 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 the readiness to be able to meet emerging demands and future demands. And so uh, the President's budget has uh, a prioritized list of uh, critical assets and critical um, funding support that will allow us to not only continue to restore readiness uh, for our aging infrastructure and aging assets, but then also be able to meet future demands for, uh, for service for the, for, for the Coast Guard. And I believe you need more money. I believe almost every element of American defense and homeland security needs more money. As we have more and more threats from overseas and from neighbors in Central America. But we have to realize as Congress people that things cost money. And 
the continuing resolution hurt you when we had a when we had not approved the budget for next year, y'all were operating with less funds and it affected your abilities. We need to be willing to take the difficult votes to pass revenue measures to serve our defense teams, our homeland security teams, and protect our country. Just putting out jingoistic comments about America and protect us and close our border and build walls and all that kind of stuff doesn't get it. It takes, yes, I vote for the budget or I will vote for additional funds. That's what we need in so many areas and I'm going to be willing to do it. I know in cybersecurity there's going to be a whole lot more and you've got trouble dealing with Silicon Valley wanting to take a lot of people you probably want to serve in this important area. These ports are vulnerable and cyber is a future warfare. So uh, I just hope you'll quietly let your voices be known to folks that they need to support funding and not just rhetoric. Thank you for your service. I know what happened in Baltimore is being dealt with, uh, you know, and I guess anything could happen. Uh, Mr. Jimenez mentioned that. I, I, don't, I don't expect ISIS or somebody to get a gigantic car container cargo container and have lots of containers on it and be able to bring down a bridge. But they could do something, and, and, and you're responsible. So we want to give you the funds to be able to do the job. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. That concludes um, our second panel, and uh, we we'll thank the witnesses. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony and the information you've given us, and you are excused. It looked like it was one camera there is doing for, you know, for the surface. Wow, he did good. It's the shirt. <laughs> I knew it. When you wear that shirt, you got to have What happens to you? The shirt? Yes. I think I'm okay. Carvajal said I was pretty good. Okay, for our third panel, I would like to welcome them and the witnesses and ask them to uh, get prepared. You're next. Uh, our third panel consists of industry experts operating in and around ports as the primary users of the opera uh, and uh, operators of ports aware of safety, security, and infrastructure investment needs, and only today, but for the long-term sustainability and success. So, as noted earlier, the beginning of this hearing, uh, your written testimony has been made a part of the record. Therefore, uh, we'd ask you to limit your remarks to the time allotted, five minutes. Uh, with that, Mr. Fowler, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. 
Chairman Webster, Chairman Jimenez, Ranking Members Carbajal and Tanadar, members of the committee, I'm honored to appear here today to discuss critical issues concerning port safety, security, and infrastructure investment. I'm James Fowler, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Shipping at Crowley. We're a U.S.-owned and operated maritime energy and logistics solutions company serving commercial and government sectors with over 170 vessels, mostly in the Jones Act fleet, and approximately 7,000 employees around the world, employing more U.S. mariners than any other company. The Crowley Enterprise has invested more than $3.2 billion in maritime transport, which is the backbone of global trade and the global economy. As a ship owner operator and transportation services provider with more than 130 years of innovation and a commitment to sustainability, Crowley serves customers in 36 nations and island territories. We sincerely appreciate the committee's continued work towards making America's ports the most efficient, safe, and secure in the world. Crowley has operations and ports along the U.S. Coast, East Coast, East Coast and Gulf Coast, including Gulfport, Mississippi, Mobile, Alabama, Port Everglades in Jacksonville, Florida, Wilmington, North Carolina, and Eddystone, Pennsylvania. These facilities support our U.S. customers as well as customers in Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America. We also have significant operations in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and in the U.S. Virgin Islands. While the investigation of the terrible and tragic collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore continues, it reminds us all that safety is of critical importance to the maritime industry in all transportation modes. We also see that our nation's intricate supply chain is vulnerable to disruption, and industry must continue to work collaboratively with federal officials to address these issues. Post 9-11, our industry has made significant changes to operations and procedures to increase security at all of our ports. As a port stakeholder, we take our obligations in this area seriously, and we work closely with a number of federal agencies, including CBP, the U.S. Coast Guard, and CISA. While the focus over the past 20 years has been on security physical threats, we've become increasingly prepared for cyber threats. Crowley works closely with both the CISA Maritime Modal Sector Coordinating Council and the Customs Trades Partnership Against Terrorism Program to address industry cyber and supply chain concerns. We're also mindful of the concerns raised over the last year involving cranes manufactured by ZPMC. While Crowley does not own any ZPMC cranes, we know they're extensively used in U.S. ports, including some in which we operate. The recent executive order on this and other cybersecurity matters brings further attention to the critical role that ports in the maritime sector have in our economy, and Crowley looks forward to working with our government partners on proposals to strengthen security and resiliency of our marine transportation system. An important part of maintaining resiliency in our supply chains is ensuring that our nation's port infrastructure receives the investment necessary to accommodate the movement of trade, both now and in the future. Crowley is investing in port electrification in coordination with local, state, and federal partners, particularly MARAD. Port infrastructure development grants have been critical to expanding electrification efforts in ports like Jacksonville, where we're in the early stages of a project to build out electrical connections for hundreds of refrigerated containers. These improvements will decrease our diesel fuel usage and cost, reduce air and noise pollution, and increase equipment uptime and efficiency. We've also worked with our public sector partners to utilize PIDP grant funding for desperately needed upgrades to the Crown Bay Terminal in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands and to begin construction of New England's flagship offshore wind terminal in Salem, Massachusetts. PIDP grants should continue to be available and expanded to ensure that we don't lose momentum in addressing the needed port improvements across the U.S. In conclusion, while progress has been made in addressing various challenges facing the maritime industry, continued vigilance and investment are essential to ensure the safety, security, and resilience of our ports and supply chains. I commend the committees for their dedication to these critical issues and stand ready to collaborate in advancing solutions that strengthen our nation's marine transportation systems infrastructure and competitiveness. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Wong, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Webster, Chairman Jimenez, Ranking Member Carbajal, Ranking Member Tandador, and Congressman Cohen. My name is Fred Wong. I'm the Deputy Port Director here at Port Miami, and Miami welcomes you all 
and we appreciate you guys uh, addressing critical topics in the maritime transportation system. I respectfully ask that my written testimony be read into the record, sir. The objection to that, Dan. Thank you. Before I begin, I want to extend my condolences to the families of those lost in the collapse of, of Baltimore uh, at the Key Bridge last week. Our nation's port industry stands with Baltimore now. My testimony is given on behalf of the American Association of Port Authorities, AAPA. AAPA represents over 80 U.S. ports on urgent and pressing issues facing our industry, promoting common interests of the port community and providing critical industry leadership on security, trade, port development, and other operational issues. According to Ernst & Young, ports move $5.4 million in imports and exports, or roughly 20% of the U.S. economic activity, while supporting 2.5 million jobs. Ports need robust federal funding and streamlined construction to expand capacity and reduce emissions at every point in our operations. We simply cannot do this without your federal support. The ports are concerned because the annual appropriations in the President's budget request for the port infrastructure development programs have all decreased. The President's budget request was lowered by $150 million, and the appropriations for PDIDP was lowered from $212 million in FY23 to only $50 million in FY24 for competitive grants. Although ports mainly operate independently, they are part of a larger system. A crisis at one port, such as Baltimore, means that all the other ports must absorb all the other cargo flow. The Committee on the Maritime Transportation System estimates that for every dollar spent on our maritime supply chain returns three dollars of economic activity. We ask Congress to fund port infrastructure projects at the level on par with other modes of transportation across the globe. To significantly improve project delivery at all ports, the Port Act has been referred to the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. This bill will allow MARAD to expand the list of categorical exclusions and increase access to the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council. We are partners with the U.S. Cus Customs and Border Protection, and shortages of CBP officers and agriculture specialists are a chronic problem with most of our seaports. CBP's workload staffing model reveals a deficit of 1,750 officers and 250 agriculture specialists nationally. This deficit significantly impacts processing time at our seaports. CBP also faces funding shortages for their federal inspection facilities at our ports. In recent years, CBP has turned to our port authorities to pay for major upgrades and new facilities, which is unsustainable. We thank Congresswoman Lee for introducing the CBP Space Act, which will allow CBP to access existing user fees to fund their federal facilities at seaports and sets guidelines around what ports are expected to provide. At all of our seaports, cybersecurity is our top priority. We thank Chairman Jimenez for his leadership on the maritime security. As the U.S. Coast Guard sets MARSEC directives, we're, we're requiring certain cybersecurity standards for the maritime sector. AAPA members are weighing in on the notice of proposal rulemaking to ensure regulations comport with facility operations while keeping our industry protected. Ports are cognizant of the increased use of connected equipment, including ship-to-shore gantry cranes. While our industry works on long-term solutions, such as reshoring and manufacturing of critical cargo handling equipment, ports and maritime terminals have taken steps to ensure the safety and security of our operations. Last year, after touring Port Miami with Chairman Jimenez, Congressman Gallagher, Chairman of the Select Committee on Chinese Communist Party, said that he felt that ports were doing what they needed to do to mitigate potential risks only in the short term. The Port Security Grant Program is the only program dedicated to port security improvements and upgrades, but funding has dropped significantly, and we ask Congress to increase the PSGP funding as well. As hubs to commerce and trade, our U.S. seaports will continue to contribute the nation's supply chain. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of AAPA today, and I look forward to answering your questions, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. The, uh, Mr. Sadler, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, again, distinguished members of Congress, thank you for the opportunity to be appear before you in this great city, the Port of Miami. And as a sailor, I got to say thank you again for hosting next month's uh, Fleet Week. And as a sailor, I certainly didn't need another excuse, a good excuse to come to Miami, which I will take advantage of. And, and the Port of Miami does stand out. I think it's worth kind of commenting a little bit. As it looks to grow its market presence and lead in smart port technology, it has welcomed the world's one of the largest, uh, or, I'm sorry, the largest cruise ship, the icon of the seas, and it, can, and it can serve as some of the largest container ships, the Neo Panamax container ships. Sadly, however, the nation's maritime sector is not as healthy as it needs to be. The American public has become increasingly aware that assumptions their store shelves and gas stations will be stocked can no longer be taken for granted. Since leaving COVID lockdowns, shipping backlogs have ensued, at times due to decisions in Beijing. In 2021, grounding of a container ship shut down the Suez Canal. Grain supply disruptions due to the war in Ukraine. Houthi attacks in the Red Sea and the incident last week, the very unfortunate and sad incident last week in Baltimore Harbor making, are making the case. Our prosperity, which relies to a great extent on maritime trade, is not as secure as it once was. No U.S. port ranks in the top 25 in the na of, of nations in cargo handling. China holds eight of those spots. Asia has the most new commercial shipping entrants, led again by China. The point is not that our ports don't meet today's need in general, but a lack of competitiveness has not generated a vibrancy to modernize, nor attract and recruit new mariners and shipyard workers as needed. One consequence of this malaise is on display in Baltimore Harbor, where last week the container ship Dolly collided with the Key Bridge and the unfortunate killing of six people. While investigations and recovery operations are ongoing, and it will be some time before we know all the facts, it's clear our nation's maritime industrial sector has not been treated as the strategic asset that it is. One only has to look at the limited salvage capacity on hand to reopen the nation's ninth port. I go into greater detail about this in my statement, but in short, a national maritime initiative is needed to rectify our over-reliance on non-friendly nations to sustain our economy and ensure safe maritime operations. Such an act would, first, provide adequate American flag commercial shipping. Second, expand shipbuilding, repair and salvage capacities and associated workforce. Third, harden maritime infrastructure and shipping to cyber attack and material damages. On the first, existing approaches are inadequate. Change is needed, but only while taking a maritime Hippocratic oath to do no harm to the legacy Jones Act domestic maritime industrial sector. At the same time, the March 12th petition against unfair Chinese trade practices in the maritime, logistics, and shipbuilding sectors is an opportunity. An opportunity to not only strengthen U.S. agencies like the Federal Maritime Commission to press America's case, but to rally international support. Delivering on the second, a stronger and global competitive maritime sector serves as a deterrent to Chinese economic coercion and military adventures. This can be done by fostering a revolution in shipping through a new multimodalism. Achieving this, American trade can proceed with greater confidence and resiliency and better sustain our military. Lastly, and perhaps most relevant due to recent events, legal and regulatory frameworks of the post-9-11 era should be reviewed with an eye to adjusting to the new Cold War that we find ourselves in with China. To start with, the Maritime Security Act of 2002, the Container Security Initiative, and the Proliferation Security Initiatives should be updated with China in mind while placing into law measures of both the 2020 National Maritime Cybersecurity Plan and the recently enacted executive order to ensure measures that are taken today are sustained, which bolster our maritime sector's cyber defenses. Safeguarding the nation's ports, economy, and defense requires a national maritime initiative, which begins with an update to the 1989 National Security Directive on sea lift and enabling legislation from Congress that hardens the nation's maritime infrastructure strengthens U.S. ability to combat un Chinese, unfair Chinese maritime practices and regain Ameri American maritime competitiveness, create maritime prosperity zones, establish a maritime innovation incubator, train more mariners, and incentivize those mariners who maintain their certifications and create a naval guard for disaster response as well as crisis management. This is not an easy nor cheap but failing to address the nation's sea blindness will further place our nation's economic and national security in the hands of non-friendly parties. Thank you again, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you.
Now, Mr. McCarthy, you're recognized for or five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Webster and ranking members and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to testify here at the field hearing today. I thank Chairman Gray's recent visit to us in Savannah and the committee's support of all the initiatives that you are endeavoring in. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Georgia Port Authority and a member of the National Association of Waterfront Employers. We are very appreciative of the federal infrastructure grants that will help U.S. ports and marine terminal operators to become more resi resilient. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about U.S. ports and marine terminal operators on safety, security, and the infrastructure investments that are needed. The Georgia Port Authority employs 1,700 direct employees and over 3,000 ILA employees. GPA, GPA has invested $3 billion since 2012, mostly all of that uh, self-invested, self-financed Georgia Ports revenues. Georgia, uh, Georgia Ports plans to spend another $4.5 billion over the next 10 years to build more port infrastructure, which will prim primarily enhance and uh, be financed by the Georgia Port Authority. There are two pillars by the Georgia Port Authority. One, containers, which are done in Savannah, Georgia. This is the third ranking volume port in, in North America behind LA Long Beach and New York, New Jersey. The second is automobiles and machinery in Brunswick, the fastest growing roll-on, roll-off port, and the second largest only behind Baltimore, who, we are, who our hearts and prayers go out to all those in the Baltimore City region. Ports are an economic engine creating, and keep, <clears throat> creating jobs and keeping America competitive. According to a recent study by UGA, University of Georgia, Georgia Ports supports more than 600,000 jobs indirectly in the state of Georgia, contributing $40 billion in income, $170 billion in revenue, and $5 billion in local taxes. The subcommittee attendance here in the field today demonstrates the importance of ports and, and marine terminal operators as a foundation of the American economy. The Bureau of Transportation Statistics reports approximately 47.7 million TEUs of equipment <clears throat> of uh, containers were handled in U.S. ports and marine terminal operators. This represents 41 percent of U.S. international trade value and almost $1.9 trillion. In addition, U.S. ports and MTOs directly support the development and sustainment of our U.S. military. Since 9-11, all ports have, been, have a robust facility security plan, which is approved by the U.S. Coast Guard. GPA, uh, <clears throat> most ports vo uh, voluntarily with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection are certified by a customs trade partnership against terrorism. And I concur with Mr. Wong's uh, remarks with funding for CBP and headcount. Georgia Ports contracts on the ship to shore cranes are with a company called Coney Cranes in Finland. The cranes technology is made in the U.S., Japan, and China. These ship to shore cranes are more expensive, but we think that the higher quality delivers Hot, better uptime on the cranes and justifies a total lifetime cost of ownership. Turning to cybersecurity, U.S. ports are primary, this is our primary uh, priority at a multi tier level approach, working with U.S. Coast Guard Security Cyber Terrorism Unit and the FBI Cyber Team. We look forward to working with the U.S. Coast Guard and this subcommittee on these matters. We greatly appreciate this, this subcommittee's endeavor today and the important work you are doing for our country. We, th we thank you for this invitation in the field hearing today. I'm truly grateful for the support U.S. ports and marine terminals are securing through the maritime supply chain and your efforts on the, uh, for the U.S. workforce and, and ports. I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Mr. Morgan, you recognized. Good morning, Chairman Webster and Chairman Jimenez, Ranking Member Carbajal, Ranking Member Tanadar, and Congressman Cohen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Dave Morgan. I'm the president of Cooper Ports America. 
um, and also the representing, uh, I'm the current president of the board of directors at National Maritime Safety Association, better known as NIMSA. Um, and I can assure the committee that being from Texas, I never have a tie on, <laughs> ever, ever, ever. <laughs> However, today, an honor, it's an honor to wear a tie for the system, but it's also a Ports America Baltimore tie in honor of my colleagues and families up in the Baltimore area. Um, by way of background, Cooper Ports America is a joint venture between Cooper, the Cooper Group of Companies and Ports America. Um, we operate, CPA operates in the Texas ports. Um, we handle about approximately 25% of the container volume handled in Houston and about 82% of the general cargo handled in the Port of Houston and in outports in Texas. Um, we employ over 3,300 company and international longshoremen union labor and operate on average about 1.65 million man hours annually. Um, on port safety, at, safe, at CPA, safety drives everything we do and is led by uh, the participation of all personnel. A safe workplace will result from positive attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs of our CPA team. We strive to create a healthy and injury-free environment for all employees and visitors to our facilities and operations. We measure our business success by safety excellence and will never waver in this commitment. Very similar in parallel, the focus and purpose of NIMSA in marine cargo handling safety, which has been our mission since NIMSA was formally established in 1972 through the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. Prior to that formation, NIMSA's predecessor was the Management Advisory Cargo Handling Safety Committee that was launched in 1956. NIMSA is a diverse association focused on safety, and one of the main objectives of NIMSA is to maintain a network of professionals capable of addressing and involving safety issues of cargo handling industry. NIMSA members are all dedicated volunteers, and this collective of progressive expertise serves as a primary resource to the industry to keep workers healthy and injury free. NIMSA also has a technical committee that holds regular meetings at ports across North America, invites guests from port employers, local, state, and federal agencies, and local union representatives to join our discussions to promote maritime safety. During these open meetings, ports are toured, safety management is discussed, accidents and injuries are examined for increased hazard recognition, and new preventive methods are, and new safety training products are prepared and experts are invited to present at technical aspects of equipment, including technical engineering details. Importantly, professional networks are expanded through this collegial information sharing environmental and continually drive a proactive approach for addressing safety at the workforce. Some of NIMSA's current areas of focus are the safety of alternative fuels, sources for cargo handling equipment, anti-collision technologies to detect people working around machines, fulfilling OSHA's new requirements for e-filing of the injury and illness data, improving pre-shift safety talks, ensuring safety on elevated working surfaces when working on gondola rail cars, recognizing and addressing drug and alcohol matters, heat illness prevention best practices, training workers on powered industrial trucks, pit, mooring line snapback injury prevention, lockout tag up program best practices, and split rim wheel safety best practices. Um, we are also very concerned on security. Um, we have we follow um, the MTOs follow the local and state and federal guidelines on security, um, and we have our own internal systems on security. That's all part of my testimony. And in closing, I encourage both of your committees and your key staff to engage with NIMSA and its technical committee to share information and any concerns about the maritime transportation system. I would also like to extend an invitation to committee members and your staff to come visit our terminals in Texas and meet the hardworking people that keep cargo moving and play an integral role in our supply chain. Our industry experts stand ready to answer any questions you may have, serve as a resource on any safety related matters and assist you in any way we can. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to be with you at today's field hearing and share my perspectives on critical safety and security issues. 
Again, I appreciate the attention of your two committees on ensuring the safety of security of U.S. ports, marine terminal operators, and all the workers we employ in our maritime supply chain. I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. We now turn to the questions for the, the third panel, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Fowler, given the large range of vessels that uh, Crowley operates, are there any categories on the shore side uh, part of this that are lacking and that they don't meet, quite meet the needs that are necessary? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the question. I want to make sure I answer your question adequately, uh, specifically as it relates to, to the shore side. How can I uh, direct my response? Well, just uh, from the uh, – are there certain services that are lacking in Understood. being provided? Thank you. I appreciate the question. Uh, so Crowley operates many, many different types of vessels, right? We operate container vessels. We operate uh, petroleum and chemical transportation vessels. We operate uh, general cargo vessels. We operate government vessels. Uh, so as our vessels come in and out of the U.S. ports, uh, we, the U.S. ports are, are, are adequate. Uh, they, they offer great service for us. Um, the, 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 the areas in which we operate, uh, when we talk about uh, after in the COVID and, and the congestion that occurred on the West Coast, the areas that Crowley's operating, servicing the Caribbean, servicing the islands, servicing South America, uh, really weren't met with those challenges. And so uh, we, have a, we have a great system uh, that, that operates well and in and, and, and conjunction with our partners in ports uh, across the country. Uh, we've, we've had great service here in, 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 in large part to the continued investment in those ports. So from an operator's perspective, are there any, uh, would you say there, what's the most pressing immediate needs for our nation's ports? Thank you for your question. Um, you know, for us operating, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll say that the, 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 the greatest challenges that we as operators face right now relate to mariner shortage. And this is something that we can take action on. And it's something that's of critical importance to us in ensuring that our vessels maintain an operation. Uh, today, we have vessels that at times are not operating because of inadequate mariner uh, levels that, that would need to operate those vessels. Uh, and so I would, I would put that in two different categories. Uh, the first category would be in attracting new uh, talent to our, to our system uh, and making aware uh, our industry. And this is an industry-wide problem. We need the support from Mayrad and others to, to make aware and bring in more into our industry. Uh, the second, I would say, is that we have, as it relates to the mariner shortage, uh, we have mariners who uh, want to continue to progress through the system and upgrade their licensing and are struggling to do so. In some cases, uh, they, it, it will take 100 plus days of classroom time and, and, and up to $80,000 of their personal funding to, to see those upgrades. And you can imagine that if you've been at sea for 120 days to come back then on your on your off time when you when you want to be with your family who you've been away from to have to then go spend 100 days in the classroom and to invest significant dollars there are ways for us to to modernize that process to reduce the financial burden uh, to to have more uh, internet delivery uh, e-delivery of that of that material that makes it easier for those mariners to upgrade their licensing but if you're if, from an operator standpoint the, the critical need that we have now is ensuring that we have adequate uh, mariners in our system. Today, we're, we're in a mariner shortage, and it's, it's a crisis across our industry, and, and we certainly need some support in ensuring that we can solve this together. It's kind of a crisis everywhere. It is. For every right. kind of worker. Uh, Mr. Wong, during the, the pandemic, we saw substantial supply chain disruptions uh, driven by numerous factors, all kinds of inability just to move cargo. Uh, have you seen any improvement in the intermodal uh, side of, of what's happening? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Um, absolutely. Here at, uh, at Port Miami and uh, the majority of the Florida seaports, um, uh, beneficially, we, we didn't really have uh, as much of the stock hold of, of vessels out in Anchorage, um, be it as it may. Uh, the Florida seaports, uh, they, they have a, efficient operations um, and uh, sufficient equipment. Uh, as far as the challenges that, uh, that I think the nation ended up uh, 
uh, encountering was most definitely staffing uh, ro rotation of, of shifts to make sure that everyone was, wasn't um, um, hit by COVID at the same time. There was a lot of mechanisms that ports had to take uh, as, as an industry as a whole to, to be safe during COVID. But uh, as far as the, the Florida seaports as a whole, um, we, were, we were blessed that we didn't have any of that congestion here uh, at our Florida seaports. Uh, Chairman Jimenez, you are recognized for five minutes. Or did I? No, I got Carvajal. Sorry. I forgot you were uh, I'm right. easy. Um, okay, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wong and Mr. McCarthy, the bipartisan infrastructure law provided $2.25 billion in advanced appropriations for the Port Infrastructure Development Program. How important is that funding to your ports? And how will it help you lower emissions from your facilities? It's a softball for a good answer. All right, Ed, I'll, I'll take it first right. since it's a softball. No. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, as, as far as funding goes, you know, uh, one thing I would say about the, the maritime industry and infrastructure, nothing is cheap uh, in, in the maritime industry. Uh, infrastructure such as uh, specifically Port Miami, we have a lot of infrastructure that we're operating on, but it's towards the end of life. Um, and as far as processes, funding that, uh, that's available, let me tell you, our, our port will take any funding uh, available. Our, our north bulkhead, uh, for example, where almost all of our cruise vessels end up um, uh, berthing at. We, don't, we only have one uh, cruise terminal on the south side uh, specifically for smaller vessels, but our entire north side, our entire bulkhead needs to get replaced. And that infrastructure and that funding is essential for us to continue to grow and, and just to continue to operate uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Uh, the phasing of construction is essential as well. And, and you know, when you talk about um, aging infrastructure, we're talking about upwards of $500 million dollars uh, and, and on estimates as far as our, our north bulkhead. So it is, it is expensive. Uh, it is uh, a length of time for construction, especially during operations. Great. Thank you for the question. The infrastructure bill and the amount of funds is critical to the United States and to ports and infrastructure. For Georgia Port Authority, as you could see by what we submitted as our attachment, three pages of grants over the last 36 months that we have been blessed to get from, uh, from Congress and federal, uh, federal grant programs. We are currently applying for a resilient grant for to uh, make our electric more robust so we can shift from uh, rubber tire gantry cranes to E. Uh, electric gantry cranes in our yard. So the infrastructure bill is critical not only to Georgia but to the entire nation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fowler, uh, first I wanted to um, give you credit for Crowley stepping up uh, to embrace the Embark program. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So with that praise comes great responsibility. Uh, but I do want to recognize how your uh, company stepped up and uh, led on, on that issue. So uh, with that, uh, domestic cabotage laws require vessels carrying cargo between two U.S. ports be built, owned, and crewed by Americans. Those vessels are also governed by stricter Coast Guard regulations. What role does the Jones Act have on economic security and port security? Thank you, and thank you for your comments. I very much appreciate the recognition of our embracing the Embark program. Uh, the Jones Act is critically important for, for our nation's security. Uh, so Jones Act, of course, we have U.S. mariners on these vessels, and this is, I think, with the conflict going on around the, the world, there's a, the, a heightened sense and awareness to, of the importance of having U.S. mariners uh, that, are, that are in not only in main, coming in and out of our ports, but in our inland waterway system that we have U.S. mariners where you don't have the robust security of a port, but in our inland, our inland waterway system along the coastal U.S., critically important to our nation's security that those are American vessels owned by American companies and crewed by 
by American Mariners. Uh, I, so in terms of the reliability, of course, you, you talked about the, the heightened regulations around U.S. vessels, uh, the, the, as it relates to vessel requirements, it relates to audits, as it relates to crew training, uh, crew regulations. It gives us certainly from a, a resiliency and having those American Americans on those vessels uh, creates great economic impact for those families. Uh, many of these jobs uh, are are six-figure jobs, well into six figures. These are high-paying jobs that support American families uh, across the, across the country, and they ensure uh, at a greater level that our reports remain resilient and safe. Thank you. Um, this is to all the panel. I'm not. I'm going to be out of time, so I'm going to ask. I'm going to submit this question for the record and ask that you follow up with an answer, if you could. Uh, to all the witnesses, this question is for all the witnesses. As I mentioned, every maritime port obviously happens to be on the water and is therefore subject to rising sea level and extreme weather events. What are you doing to prepare for the future, and how expensive is that preparation? I'll submit that for the, for the record. If you could follow up, that would be great. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Hemenev, you are recognized, Chairman, uh, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Wong, um, are you familiar with all the cruise ships that uh, dock here at the uh, Port of Miami, home port here? Yes, Mr. Chair. How many were built in the United States? From what I can recollect, none of the cruise vessels that are coming here right none now. None of the cruise ships are. That's correct, are, are sir. Are you familiar with most of the, the cargo ships that, uh, that dock here? Yes, Mr. Chair. How many of those are built in the United States? From what I can recollect, uh, none, sir. Uh, Mr. Sadler, that's a sad, sad state of affairs, uh, to say the least. What, uh, what has caused this? Why is it? Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of brief history. The, during World War II, uh, for every aircraft carrier that the Japanese built, we built six. If we were to get into a conflict with China now, we would be Japan and they would be us, although much worse. How do we get to this? And how do we, how do we rectify it? How do we strengthen our shipbuilding capacity here in the United States? Also, another little tidbit, the largest navy in the world now <clears throat> is the navy of the PRC. No, I love this question, and I'll be very cognizant of the limited time that we have on this. The, the, looking forward, I mean, there, there, we can go and look at the history, but going, looking forward, the way that we can best address this is focusing on our competitiveness. I mean, we have a legacy fleet in the Jones Act, which has been that way for 100 years. We have to get more competitive in the global marketplace. We have to change and reorganize for the task. Our maritime agencies are scattered about several different departments. We need to organize for task. We need to focus on competitive measures, make it lucrative to be a, a merchant mariner, make it lucrative to be a shipyard worker because those are high paying jobs. We just need more people there. We need to start building more competitively than we have been. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The, does the PRC, are they engaged in some unfair practices that, that give them an advantage? Uh, absolutely. It's a state owned enterprises. And so uh, they benefit both from direct and also indirect subsidies. They also take their orders most often, uh, it, not from an economic perspective, but from a Communist Party's perspective. So they are not a free market entity. And so that allows them to put national assets behind whatever their strategic interests are. If it's buying access into a port, if it's designing ships at a lower cost so that they can elbow in or to take over market share, they'll still do it. Now, there's still a lot of comparative advantages that our allies and that we have in this sector. We just have not taken full advantage of it. And that's probably where the solution lies, where we are today. Is there, is there legislation needed to, <clears throat> to accomplish this? Uh, absolutely. I think there's probably a family of legislation uh, that can't come soon enough, quite frankly. Okay, since, uh, you know, this is a, a, an interesting or a great kind of melding of the three committees that I actually serve on. I serve on HASC. Uh, armed Services. I serve on the Select Committee on China, and I obviously serve, you know, serve in uh, Homeland Security. I would love to, to get uh, all of your perspectives on the legislation that we need in order to keep America safe. I mean, we're talking about port security, but now we're really talking about security of the United States. And it really concerns me that that of all the ships that come here, 
none of them are built in the United States. Probably none of them are either are, are, are um, staffed by American sailors. Uh, they're probably staffed by foreign sailors. So final question on the licensing, uh, Mr. Fowler, uh, which you talked about. Uh, are the licensing requirements different for U.S. Uh, sailors versus uh, maritime personnel versus uh, maritime personnel from around the world? Thank you for your question. And certainly there are, there are differences. Um, and so for us, you know, some of the challenges that we face in applying for those licenses today, to give you some perspective, uh, you know, we've got at Crowley 100, 100 jobs today that if we could work through a more efficient licensing process could be immediately filled over 100 jobs that are waiting um, uh, to be filled that Mariner licensing could, if we could expedite that process, would resolve. Today... I, it, I need to cut you off because I've, I've got one more thing sure. that I want to follow. i only got 30 seconds. Um, the, the ships that dock here that don't have American sailors, they have different licensing requirements, but yet we allow them to dock in American ports. Is... Is that a disadvantage for, for American sailors also? I mean, why, are, why do we have these licensing requirements for our folks, and yet we allow folks from other countries that aren't licensed the same way to operate on U.S. ports, if, in fact, it's all about safety? It, it should be about safety, uh, Congressman, and, and I, I would I would ask that we defer to, to the Coast Guard to understand the differences and to, to provide that detail to make sure that, that that safety element is being satisfied. Fair enough. Thank you. Now yield back. Thank you, Mr. Tandar. Thank you, Chairman Webster. Um, and again, thank you, Mr. Wong, uh, for hosting us here today in this beautiful venue. Uh, the collapse of the key, key bridge um, impacted all of your organizations in one way or other. What lessons, if any, can we learn from this collapse and uh, look from a point of safety. And my second question is that um, are, do we have the right perspective in terms of um, our spendings, our budget, our spending on um, security, protecting our homeland in general? Are certain areas has a higher emphasis than other areas, and is that justified? Uh, are we leaving some areas so vulnerable uh, to the attacks because we are all focused on a certain different areas? So I just wanted to get a perspective from all of you on lessons learned and uh, how do you see the budgets and how does that impact? I'll, I'll take the first stab at it. Great question. And um, first up on the bridge, it's, I mean, we are still in the process of discovery, but there are clearly, clearly a few lessons that, right, first off. One, protective dolphins, which would have prevented or deflected the full force of the Dali from taking out the bridge, were not in place. This was based on a, a similar incident that happened in 1980, but yet in the intervening years, nothing was done. How many other bridges are likewise not hardened because shipping has changed dramatically in the intervening years? So there's, there's, there's a task that doesn't take very long to figure out that needs to get done. Um, when it comes to priorities, which is what I really think the issue is on resourcing, it's been easier to focus on other areas. It's been easy to kick the can down the road because we had the best infrastructure, we had the best fleets, but now our competitors have caught up and a lot of that infrastructure, the educational for merchant mariners and the ability for us in, to have that presence of the market share has been eroded. So it's time now to basically kind of get back to the gym and to get competitive again, in my mind. Thank you, Mr. Sadler. I'll take, <clears throat> take the next part of it. As far as it really comes down to infrastructure, that it's not just the bridges that need to be resilient, but or tunnels that need to be uh, constructed to remove those impediments. 
but it's also about the infrastructure of our waterways. Some of our waterways in the country are not deep enough or wide enough, and we need funding for that. I know the word of bill is being uh, discussed at the T&I committee, and deepening harbors and widening them. I know Savannah is requesting uh, a study being done for the Savannah River, and I know there's other regions of the country that need more infrastructure on as a lesson learned of what we need to do. As far as the cost and, and the funding goes, it's in the trillions of dollars if you look at the whole country. And what you are doing with the federal grants are very appreciative as a step for us to get uh, moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Just a, one thing to come back. One of the other lessons from the Baltimore issue is the salvage cap capacity that we have. I think that's something that needs to be looked at, the ability to dredge as well as remove debris. We're 10 days into it. It took less time to clear the Suez Canal. So we need to do better. We do have vulnerable ports uh, based on that question in the last session. Thank you so much. We, uh, quick question. Are, how should I say this? Um, are we more reactive to attacks and dangers as opposed to being proactive in anticipating what could happen? I think we have been probably worse than reactive. We have been complacent for far too long. Uh, we need to get more proactive in the competitive sphere with our adversary China because they have a lot, we have a lot of vulnerabilities to their economic statecraft that we need to get, get up to speed to. But when it comes to the threat, we were focused and fixated on a terrorist threat, a physical terrorist threat. And we need to update our framework and our approaches to look at a great power competitor. And it's not just China, it's also the Russians and the Iranians that are in this space that are harming us day to day. All right, thank you so much. I'm out of time, so Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Cohen, you recognized. Thank you, sir. Uh, what is the liability of a shipping company, and maybe Mr. Fowler would be appropriate, I'm not sure who would be the right person. Uh, right now, when there's a disaster like, such as happened in Baltimore, are there limits on liability in statute? Thank you for your question. I appreciate that. I'd, I'd like to follow up with you after about the specifics and I can get our staff involved to make sure that we're at providing you the adequate results on that. Well, my, my staff can do that for me afterwards. But for right now, tell me what your liability is. So our liability would be to respond. And so we have, we have contracts in place that would ensure that in the, in the event that we would respond accordingly. It take, for example, the, in, the, in this particular instance you're referring to in Baltimore, they had salvage contracts and responding contracts already in place so that immediately in hours after, um, those, those salvage responders were, were immediately responding to, to, the, to that incident. Uh, I know that because we, we were in communication with some of our services to offer our services and support to do that. So um, that there, there is what's going on in Baltimore is a joint effort beyond the ship owner plays a part. Um, but, but absolutely, uh, we would have the, the responsibility to respond and would do that proactively. How about, I mean, I thought I read there were damages and there was a limitation on damages because of some old statute. And if this shipping company was, at, was negligent, what would be, what's the liability? Uh, thank you again, Congressman. I, I'll come back to, with some more details, the specifics of that. And All right. Well, I'll find out from my staff. But what I'm getting at is there's liability, could be liability on the companies. And there shouldn't be limitations that are on some ancient law. I don't, the limitations, if there are any at all, they ought to be current. But we shouldn't give a free pass to, to the uh, maritime industry if they are negligent in causing a damage to a bridge or other facility that causes an uh, injury to a port, which causes an economic injury to the community. So we'll, we'll look into that. Uh, is there any particular port, Mr. Wong, in your opinion, that's more vulnerable than another right now? Thank you for your question, Congressman. I think. Um, as uh, the Coast Guard alluded to this morning, they do risk assessments with ports every single day. Um, our, our, port, our port here in Miami is vulnerable as well. Uh, we, we continuously train, we drill um, for response um, and, and active mitigation for what we can't control. Um, 
but to answer your question more precisely, I, I do think every port has specific critical infrastructure uh, that will hinder their operations. Um, here at Port Miami, we're a 522-acre island. We have two ports, points of access through our bridge, which is critical, and through our tunnel, which is another, another critical infrastructure. But as far as our waterways, um, we, we have one single inbound and outbound channel. It is not a two-way channel. So when a parade of vessels are going in, they're going in. When a parade of vessels are going out, it's singled up. Um, we recently, last November, had an issue where we had a down recreational vessel strike uh, a barge. She did go down in the channel. There was one fatality in the channel. Um, the response was we had five cruise vessels cutting water, standing by to come in. We had thousands of passengers coming inbound, thousands of passengers on hold on the outbound, and three container vessels as well. So when you talk about planning, mitigation, Coast Guard, our local sheriffs, our community here as port stakeholders, we drill, we take it very seriously to react as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Yes, sir. Mr. McCarthy, you mentioned uh, safety as uh, being a paramount to port operations, which of course they are. Uh, based on what you know so far, could have anything been done differently with the Francis Scott Key Bridge? I, I read a lot about some kind of supports they could have put around the, uh, on the, around the pylons and that would have diffused the, the, the impact. Could, so, that have, could that have happened? And I'm not privy to uh, the details of the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge. I can talk about what's going on in Georgia. Um, around the Sydney Lanier Bridge, which is down in Brunswick, Georgia, there are actually two-acre um, uh, rock walls around the abutment of the bridge to protect the, uh, the stanchions of the bridge down in, uh, in uh, Sydney Lanier Bridge down in Brunswick. Were they, were they constructed at the time of the, the, when the bridge was constructed, or were they added later? I'll have to get back to you on the details of that uh, question. Do you know how old that bridge is, approximately? I do not. I'll have to get back to you on that as well. Because that was an issue about, I think they said there had been, they, they could have gone back in, in Baltimore and, and, and reinforced those stanchions, but it hadn't been done. Uh, do you know of situations, anybody on the panel know of situations where they, folks have gone back and, and re-fortified uh, uh, the, the, the stanchions to, to, to guard against a potential uh, uh, strike? I am not. I think Tampa, the, the incident in 1980, yeah. they actually did. Uh, but there are other cases, I'm sure, that just not not in the top of my mind right now. There was something that happened in New Orleans some years ago. I'm not quite sure what it was. A friend of mine was an NTSB uh, back in the 90s, and he said after that there was a need for a major study, and it was mandated by Congress that it never took place. Can, can you edify us on that, Mr. Sadler? I'm not surprised. I'm not familiar with the specifics of that, I'm, but I'm not surprised that uh, other issues, other priorities at the time, are convened to make it not possible, too expensive, uh, not urgent. Thank you, each of you, for what you do, and thank you, Mr. Wong, for being the first person to recognize me today. Appreciate that very much. I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> All right. So that concludes the. Uh, the Joint Subcommittee's hearing today, and I'd like to thank each of the witnesses for coming and testifying and giving us some insightful uh, information about what's going on in the industry. So uh, the Joint Subcommittee's uh, between Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation and the Committee of Transportation and Infrastructure and the Subcommittee on Transportation and Maritime Security of the Committee on Homeland Security stands adjourned. Thank you for coming.